Hello, everyone. Welcome to the 149th annual session, Baptist Convention of the District of Columbia and Vicinity. Today, we have an interview uh, navigating a pandemic with uh, Reverend Baxter and Dr. Jerry M. Carter, Jr. Reverend Baxter, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, certainly greetings to all of you um, in the Baptist Convention of D.C. and vicinity. Uh, again, I'm grateful to be able to host this discussion um, I am Pastor Wallace Baxter III, pastor of Second Baptist Church Southwest um, here in District Heights, Maryland, um, and am grateful uh, today to be joined with none other than uh, the Reverend Dr. Jerry M. Carter. Uh, he is the pastor of Calvary um, Baptist Church, um, and he is truly um, a gem in the kingdom, uh, in the gym, in uh, the church today. And uh, he does amazing work. I, I certainly have been following him for quite some time. Um, and he hosts what I believe is one of the uh, most impactful and meaningful uh, conferences for preachers um, in in the United States today. I, I just truly believe that. And uh, not just preachers, but just uh, church leaders in general. And so we're grateful to God for all that he does and all that he um, means to the church and the kingdom. And today uh, we're going to engage in a conversation about this pandemic and about what worship looks like, church looks like, all these things. Um, and so, Dr. Carter, I am grateful to be here sir. with you today, virtually. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm grateful to be here, Dr. Baxter. And um, I want to say thank you to the Baptist Convention of D.C. and vicinity just for the opportunity to, to share a little time um, and to do some thinking about this whole subject, which has us, which has all of us going kind of crazy and has so for over a year now, for more, almost two years now. So yeah, I'm grateful to be here with you, man. Thank you. Great, great. Yeah. And so as, as you said, you probably defined it best. You said this, this thing that has uh, us all going a little bit crazy um, mm -hmm. because it's uncharted waters. And so ha have you ever experienced anything close to this? in your tenure as pastor, or just in your life, really? Yeah, um, the answer to that question is an unequivocal no. I mean, I, I wish I could give you a lot of discussion or some experience or background on that, but um, we've had, I know in ministry, we've had some interruptions here and there, whether it be, um, uh, riots or, or, or protests along the way throughout through my years of ministry, whether it's been um, thoughts about the church response to AIDS or on and on. When I go back to ministry, back to 1980s, early 80s, I started in 83 in terms of preaching. I started ministry probably about 1980. If, if it was nothing more than just teaching seat, uh, Sunday school, what, what we used to call BTU, you know, but, um, been doing something since about 1980. And uh, there's been interruptions in terms of ministry and church, things we've had to address, uh, the, uh, crack, the crack and drug, drug epidemic, on and on and on. But what we have experienced now is a disruption. There's a big difference between a disruption and an interruption. Mm -hmm. Interruption, you can kind of, you know, it's there and you have to respond to it, but you keep moving. Right. Disruption right. alters direction. A disruption sends you another whole different way and shifts the paradigm forever. So we haven't just dealt with the interruption. We have dealt with the disruption. And so that's why I say I don't I don't remember anything like this in 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 my lifetime and there's nothing in seminary there's nothing in conventions and associations that really prepare you for something like this now 
I do believe, however, that life experience can prepare you for this in terms of leadership. You know, um, right. The, 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 the word, there weren't no classes. We had at Princeton on how to or, or, or at Drew on how to navigate through something like this. But I think pastors, leaders need to call on life experience, even when there is a vacuum of pastoral experience, because life experience can feed your pastoral experience. For instance, I mean, folks in, in, in my generation, Dr. Baxter, I don't know what generation you're in, but I, I'm, a, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm 56, and so I, I go back a little bit. And so we were kind of taught to, to thrive during hardship mm. and to push things, things we had to go through. Um, my summers off from school, I worked on construction sites with my dad, who was a contractor. And I learned lessons just about pushing through hardship. I learned lessons about being flexible and not being just stuck on what you are doing. I learned lessons on maximizing moments mm-hmm. and just making the best. I mean, our grandmothers, whatnot, they showed us how to make do with what you have, even if it's I used to look in the re- in the refrigerator. I'm probably giving you more than what you asked for. Um, but I, I, I used to look in the refrigerator and tell, tell my grandmother there's nothing to eat. She would say, sit down. She would go to the refrigerator and take scraps and make, some, make something happen. So my point is lessons that I learned in non-ecclesiastical settings have helped me to make it through this ecclesiastical kind of chaos that we have been in. So to answer your question, I haven't seen anything like this. Um, I've seen interruptions. I haven't seen a disruption like this. Um, but life experience has, you know, I can, I've been, I've been able to call on it. You know, when I, when I didn't know um, if, the, if the money was going to come in, the offerings were going to come in when this first started. And um, last March, March before last, um, and I just, I was worrying and I could just hear, you know, in my ears, some of the things my parents and grandparents used to tell me. So again, to, to be redundant, I have to import into my ecclesiastical setting, what I've learned in my existential experience. I got to import it so that it, so that it feeds it because the ecclesiastical setting is not in a vacuum somewhere. It's in the context of everything else. So that's probably more what you bargain for. Wow. 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 No, no, that, that, I love that. I love that to import into your ecclesiastical setting, what you've experienced in your existential reality to to import that. That's amazing because I, 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 I hear you that, you know, the, the, there's a difference between an interruption and a disruption. Um, that uh, I guess from our life's interruptions, we, we kind of have some tools to use and to apply at least a mindset, a mentality, as you say, yes. um, that, um, you know, even as one coming a generation or so behind you um, uh, at, at, at 37, you know, I, 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 I've seen, you know, I've watched my parents, how they approach certain things. And I've watched those that have come before me, how they approach certain things. And so I I certainly appreciate that. Um, And so, so with that, with the the shock of it all, and, and just, just, um, you know, trying to, as you said, a couple of March, two marches ago, um, trying to, trying to, you know, turn a church on a dime, you know, to, to, to continue being a church you know with with because i i remember our men's day was i think the second sunday in march of 20 uh i guess it was 2019 and or 2020 rather second sunday in march and we had just had a great time and all this stuff yeah. and that following sunday all of a sudden boom we gotta shift gears and try to present some virtual what have you um you know and literally turn on a dime so do you do you feel like the church i guess uh uh you know universally but then also kind of your local situation do you feel you've met expectations in this season 
<laughs> yeah, well, I guess, I guess you, you know, you have to kind of connect with whose expectation, you know, and mm-hmm. um, I think the expectation that I speak of, and I think the one that you're talking about, is the expectation I think God has on us to be true to our calling, and I think, I think that's the expectation that we seek to to meet, and um, that's what I believe you're talking about as well, because you know people have expectations, the community does, but our expectation is that whole idea of living up to our calling. So, in answer to that, I would say, I would say yes and no. Um, you know, I don't, I don't mean to just cop out on, on, on that on that question, but I think that you know on the on the negative side that in some cases we have not lived up to the expectation because I think the pandemic became a crutch for some of us and became mm-hmm. an excuse for inactivity mm-hmm. you know, to to do nothing and I get it because man, I got real comfortable, real comfortable. I ain't have to do meetings. I ain't have to, you know, if, if I want to, I ain't have to go out and meet, meet people at the church. No uh, deacons, trustees, me. Come on, man. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, yeah. You know, no uh, driving to the church on Saturday mornings to meet with the men and all that. Um, so it was real, it was real tempting for me to just kind of chill during this time and just be on a prolonged kind of vacation and sabbatical almost. And I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but you understand my point. Oh, yeah. That in some cases, I don't think we've lived up to the expectation because um, the pandemic again became, have you noticed how everything is being blamed on COVID now? I mean, right. um, we can't get no toilet paper on the, uh, Shelves at the supermarket. Why? Because of COVID. Um, well, we our restaurant can only be open three days a week, four days a week now because we have no staff. Well, why? Well, because of COVID. Well, what happened right. to the staff mm-hmm. during COVID? Um, well, we can't mm-hmm. do it in our, this in our church anymore. Why? COVID. Because so in some cases, COVID hit us hard. It hit everything. But mm-hmm. in some cases, I think it's being used as a convenient crutch mm-hmm. um, that justifies inactivity and inertia, you know? And so uh, on one side of that coin, I don't, you know, there's some expectations. In some cases we haven't lived true to our calling, but for the most part, I'm telling you this, I've been encouraged Mm. by what I've seen and heard. I really have. I mean, um, churches on different levels have done what they could. Um, 1872, P.T. Barnum, the, the uh, circus dude, P.T. Barnum uh, decided to build his circus, if that's what you want to call it, on the property where Madison Square Garden is now located in Manhattan. Hmm. And had animals in there, all kind of different kind of side shows, freak shows, what we would call them. Um, but it burned up. I, mean, I don't know how some of this, some, some people believe it was a scandal. Maybe he burned himself, whatever. It, it burned up. And because initially he had built a circus there and he sent out invitations. People come to the circus. People come to the circus. Well, it burned up. He tried it again. Burned down a second time. That's where the whole idea came from of taking the circus mm-hmm. to different towns and cities. P.T. Barnum concluded, okay. I'm not going to force you to come to the circus. So what I'm going to do is bring the circus to you. (laughs) And the crises that he went through, the burning down of those structures, forced him to get out and take the circus to the world. Well, I think that's what happened in our churches. And I saw it happening, man, on so many different levels. Um, Some churches were prepared for it because they had already invested in technology, live streaming, mm-hmm. et cetera. Mm-hmm. Um, some, some weren't because they hadn't gotten there yet. Uh, but even those churches who hadn't invested, and in some cases, pastors were fighting with leadership and churches because we, we know we needed to invest in it, but people were hesitant. Well, they were forced to. 
And I saw some churches do it and yeah. did it very well for their context. And mm-hmm. that's the key. Um, churches can't be judged by other churches. Mm-hmm. You can only be judged by your own potential and capability. And so um, I saw small churches uh, who, who don't necessarily have all the resources that some of these mega places have. They did it on their level. Mm-hmm. And they reached people um, by setting up different kind of worship, you know, worship experiences online. And then not just worship experiences, but Christian education and formation opportunities uh, mm-hmm. online. And then also kind of small group uh, meetings and gatherings um, via Zoom. So I saw it happen in churches where people would have never thought about it but we were Hmm. forced to do it, forced to think about it. So in answer to your question, yes, I I think that in more cases than not, that the expectation to the best of our ability has been met. And I think that's the key. You define success and mean expectation according to your context and Hmm. not according to comparison. Yeah. if Yeah. If I compare my thing to somebody down the road, it may look like I, I ain't doing nothing, you know. Yeah. But I have yeah. to, I have to just put that up against what we can do uh, based on our budget, based on our resources, based on our staff or volunteers. So I saw it happening across the board on everyone mm-hmm. on all different levels. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's so important for folks to hear the the this whole idea of contextual ministry that that ministry is is about context like you know if if your church as as many churches do let's say it moves from the inner city to the suburbs your context has changed and what mm-hmm. makes you effective now has to change because it's not going to be the same and and sure. i yeah i i agree that i've i've seen you know some some churches that that were able to shift in their own way and and meet the needs of you know various individuals, yeah, which had, is had, so important. Yeah, I had to turn quickly. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I had to start giving attention to stuff like lighting, mm-hmm. uh, sound, um, and and all of that because our congregations again became virtual, and um, and 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 the investment of ministry needed to be in the whole virtual experience. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. it's it's interesting. And I think I think it's going to the 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 true test I think is upon us in in trying to figure out okay, now how do we push, you know, beyond this with with what we've learned, you know, mm-hmm. having this disruption happen, you know, like like you said with with Barnum like, you know, do you know, bringing this to people now, we can't stop that because sure. it's got to continue and so the the quote unquote new normal you know for church even um is is certainly going to be be pushed and 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 different it's going to be sure. different um, you know uh what do you see as like the major challenges for us right now um with with this whole thing um Challenges, plural. I could talk about a few challenges, but let me tell you something. I think there's one Herculean challenge, singular, that we're going to have to get over, and that is apathy. Mm -hmm. Apathy and lethargy. Just what I'm noticing in my context across the board, as I said, is that people are now using the pandemic and fear of getting this virus to some degree as an excuse not to come back to church. Um, See, the thing is, we were were dealing with, to some degree, church decline before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So some of what we're seeing can't be blamed on a pandemic. There was a decline in many mainline churches, uh, maybe maybe not as much in some of the uh, trans-denominational, what they call them now, uh, word churches, and all, maybe not as much there, but in some of our mainline mm-hmm. churches, um, people weren't coming 
as much for for a few reasons. Mm-hmm. One of them being, I know in my church, we uh, started streaming some years ago. I don't know, maybe five years ago and four years ago, five years ago. And people um, saw that as a mechanism of convenience. So mm-hmm. if it's raining too hard, I don't feel like coming out, I'm, you know, I'm having a bad, bad hair, hair day or whatever. <laughs> I just stay home and just click, and just click some buttons. Well, the pandemic, man, has hardened people in that mindset. Yeah. So uh, apathy is it. Um, on, on my street, I noticed that for a minute, everything was opening up but the church. Hmm. Everything was reopening. Uh, Walmart was reopening. Um, the supermarket was. Um, my gym did. Uh, the schools were. I just looked. My, my, my street, my church is on Martin Luther King Avenue. And I just looked up and down. And I said to myself, what message does it send that everything else is opening up and we're closed? Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. um, now I understand. Don't I, I don't want to underestimate the, uh, the need to be safe and on all that and intentional about keeping our people healthy. <clears throat> people have been lost. Lives have been lost. Um, we got people dealing with grief and, and all of that. So, so this thing is real. And then the conversation about the variants and all that kind of stuff. But it sends a message, I think, to the world and to our own members that this thing, church, may not be as important. Hmm. Uh, Walmart said, we got to open to survive. You know, um, yes, they can do online sales and all that, but no, we need people coming in here. <laughs> so the greatest challenge that we're going to have to overcome is ourselves. Church is going to have to o- overcome church. And that feeling of apathy hmm. is, 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 just, is just crazy because we got comfortable. I think some of our leaders got comfortable. Um, clergy got comfortable. Our members got comfortable. Um, most, most of the time I have this conversation and some of my colleagues say, and I ain't judging, it's just the way it is. Um, yeah, doc, I ain't no hurry to open up. I ain't got to do all these services. I ain't got to go down there. And, and wait a minute, and my money's still coming in, my money coming in, right? Shoot, I ain't rushing back. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you hear that and again. I, I, you know, I ain't judging nobody. Though. Do what you do because everybody's context is different. But we got to be careful because we could be contributing to a pre-pandemic issue that I saw mm. and you saw, and that yeah. is that decline. So it's, yeah. it's it, it'll be even worse now that the, the challenge will be even greater. So I think. Our greatest challenge is going to be overcoming that apathy, some of which we have contributed to because of our reticence and our hesitance to reopen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. I see that. I see that. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) And that that money piece is real that, you know, uh, for many and and for many leaders in churches as well, you know, they 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 may be a little more reserved about, you know, pushing the envelope to get back because they're like, well, pastor, you know, things are kind of going all right. So, uh, you know, let's let's just kind of yeah, be see. in this holding pattern, you know, without ever, you know, making the strides toward getting back to you know, uh, uh, getting together for worship. Yeah, and yeah. I think, you know, I think that's the key. Like you said, um, you, you, you gotta do it. You know, you gotta have the plan in place. You gotta, yeah, gotta be safe. you know, be safe with it. And, but, but I think it's important to be honest with people to let them know about the, the strides that you're, you're trying to make, you know, to get to that, um, yeah, I, I I had one of our one of our mothers in our church, one of our not not mothers in terms of age, but um she she has two or three kids who involved in our youth ministry over the past couple of years, and she said 
And then one of the things that we did, obviously, it was we shut down some activity in youth ministry in person because, you know, trying to keep kids safe. She said, but pastor, my kids are active at school. They have to wear masks. They're active in band. Um, my son is playing football. He's exposed. Mm -hmm. The only place where he's not getting an opportunity to be physically involved is church. Hmm. Mm. Pastor, what message is that sending to my son? Yeah. You yeah. know, so that is the challenge that has to be overcome. I yeah. agree. I agree. I agree. Um, you know, we, we, because in all of us for right, for the right reasons, you know, just full stop, just said, nope, we're not yeah, doing we the. But I agree that, you know, we got to get things rolling. Um, and, and one of the things that I'm, I'm, proud of my, my church for really is that one of the things we never stopped doing was our our feeding efforts and things like that we had to reinvent how we did it you know sure. we couldn't folk couldn't come in the food pantry and shop and pull things off the shelves anymore but we had to prepackage stuff and safely put in their trunks and let them roll on things like that but i i think and i i've seen it at many churches around that that churches have thankfully kept doing those things mm -hmm. um, which help our people who are struggling right now many many of whom are struggling yes, sir. right now and and so um with that you know where do you kind of see the church headed you know uh post pandemic if we can call it that um you know politically socially missionally you know just as a body like like what are the things that you see the church will have to be engaged in moving forward well i think and, and i'll speak on, on a general level here yeah. um you know I, i'll talk a little bit more about some strategies you know a little bit later um but generally speaking i think we have to critique ourselves be able to put some space between ourselves and society and be able to prophetically critique what's going on around us. And I don't mean just complain, but <laughs> critique, you know, because all of us can get mad for, for years. A whole lot of us complain about the president we had, you know, and all that. Um, uh, and some of us preach about every Sunday. I don't know what we had to preach about after he went in, in office no more. Um, but so I think the challenge for the church now and where we should go politically, socially, missionally, and even ethically, morally now has to do with beginning to see ourselves as less institution and more movement. Mm. Um, mm. Yes. Institutionalization is necessary for survival. Mm -hmm. But whenever institutionalization begins to e eclipse the dynamism of movement, mm. then we begin to lose our effectiveness. And by movement, that means infiltrating every sector of society with the influence of the kingdom. Gotcha. That's, I, I mean that. I've really been thinking about that a lot, that our aim is to be a movement that infiltrates the world with the influence of the kingdom. And that's in, in, in the area of politics, in the areas of education, on and on and on, um, in the area of economics and business development. So the aim, when, when Jesus says, go into all the world, well now there's different ways of going into all the world. And our job is to redefine ourselves as primarily movement. Institution is the skeleton that holds the body together. But it's a bad looking body if you have more skeleton than muscle. Mm. Wow. Muscle wow. is our movement. Muscle is our dynamism. Muscle is our spirit. Um, mm. Just to maintain the institution and that's our only reason of existence then all you have is this awkward looking body with bones protruding out that nobody mm. is attracted to. That's mm. why nobody is attracted to it because nobody is attracted to a, a skeleton. 
You know, you, you, you want something, you want something on it. And if the church refuses to be that, then we become like the scene that Ezekiel was exposed to where you had a valley full of them. Right. Right. Yeah. And there yeah. was no, there was no, there, there was no movement. There was no spirit mm -hmm. in there. So, you know, that's my long way of saying, where does the church go from here? Missionally, um, socially, politically, it all has to do with redefining mm -hmm. our image so that the gotcha. emphasis is not on um, who's, who, who's going to be president and who's going to be moderate and all those kinds of, and all that stuff is important. Like I said, you got to have the skeleton, right? You got to have right. it in right. order to keep right. things in shape, but that cannot be more important than the whole idea of movement. Most, in, most, most movements become institutionalized over time hmm. because they begin, they forget their mission and begin to think about survival and just uh, existence. So that, that's that's the challenge before us is yeah. to begin to see ourselves differently. Yeah, I like that because you know I hear I hear people in the church and leaders and 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 parishioners, what have you, who who will say things like, "Oh, pastor, I can't wait to get back and get to my seat." You know, I'm, I can't wait to get back and 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 see the see those ushers march. I can't wait to get back. <laughs> and it's like, well, wait a minute, like is is that the purpose is that our you know raison d'etre is that why we're here you know sure. it's like sure. um, and and so i i see it i see it because um and my prayer is that you know we as pastors are able to you know stick to our guns for lack of a better term to say to say no no we need to go this way we need to be more as you said movement oriented and, um, and i think where that happens is where where we can do that is in our preaching and uh, and, and, and and in our teaching and re re-imaging reimagining church and what that looks like so that my church is maybe a little less interested in bylaws and a little more interested in bible a little <laughs> less interested in um, again, who's president, a little more interested in who's doing evangelism, you know? So we begin to shift people's minds um, through, it, it was, it, it was that, the late Dr. Uh, A. Lewis Patterson Sr. Who, who used to tell us that if you, whatever you wanna reproduce, do it in your preaching, cast a vision in, in preaching. And so I think that's where we start with reimagining ourselves is in our preaching and teaching, but that's that that's really our main tool. That's mm. really our main weapon. Um, mm. is warfare and our tool when it comes to to shaping people. Yeah, yeah. How how shall they hear? There you go. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah, there you go. And 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 I I'm I'm in agreement with you there. And uh, one of the things that I'll just say because maybe this might help someone who's who's listening. Uh, a couple of friends of mine here in the in the DMV, we're getting together in a couple of weeks um, for about a two three day uh, retreat, really, to help each other. You know, iron sharpens iron. To help sure. each other, just think through our preaching plan, you know, um, at the beginning of the year and through, throughout next year and, and, and what direction, you know, sure, we hear God, right. God sending us. And just because we realize that, you know, right now we got to be intentional and every preacher, every pastor, I believe has to be, and should, should always be intentional about, you know, what we're preaching, why, and, and, and what the kind of expected outcome is, you know, sure. um, there it is. There it is. Focus on your outcome and your yeah. outcome will determine your output, you know? That, huh. that really yeah. Is. Yeah. And so, 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 I mean, so preaching, yeah, we hear that. And I heard you mentioned earlier about strategies. So what are, you know, kind of some strategies that sure. um, can help us, um, you know, move, move our churches forward? Um, well, I, I have, about, you know, four or five things I just want to mention. Mm -hmm. that, that I think are, are helpful. And this is not exhaustive. I, 
I need to hear some suggestions from some other people because I'm, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm learning um, this thing too. And I've, I've talked to some people, consulted with some people. So I think number one is we have to emphasize the gathered experience. This is going to be a strategy going forward to emphasize the gathered experience. Um, again, people, some people believe that they can make it just on virtual religion alone, mm. just virtual worship, virtual. I can just go from preacher to preacher, from service to service, and just watch what I want to watch, blah, blah, blah. So I think we're going to have to emphasize the gathered experience, spend some time teaching it and preaching it, because what has happened is there's been a lost, there's been a devaluation of devaluing of sacred time and sacred space. Mm. It has been a devaluing of sacred time and sacred space. Um, you know, people do worship on demand now. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, 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 if I have a tea time at 10 o'clock on Sunday, it's cool because I can just watch church six o'clock on Sunday evening. Mm -hmm. um, and you, you, you kept hearing people say, well, we don't need the building anyway. We, we know we, we got to take Christianity outside the four walls. All these things that sound real pious and good, and they're true. Mm -hmm. But there's something critical we learn from, from worship, particularly in the Old Testament, and even in, in, into the New Testament. There's something critical about people coming together. And the building allows for the coming... I'm still a believer in, in, the, in the need for sacred space. Mm. I'm still a believer in the rituals, yeah. in the building, in the stained glass, and all of that, in the hymns. Because in the coming together, something happens. And, and, I, and I don't need to tell you this, and most people who are listening to this, I don't need to convince them. Of, but the, our, our people, we need to convince them of the importance, number one, of sacred space. Number two, of sacred time. Yes, I know that you can do worship on demand now. And I know mm -hmm. that you can watch mm -hmm. it. Oh, Pastor, I, I, I didn't hear, you know, I didn't, I didn't hear. And I understand that some, some kind, sometimes you can't. People working and all that. And then that's the beauty of them being able to tune in later and hear what you said. But people who can, we need to be worshiping together at the same time, yeah. even if it's yeah. virtual. Yeah. Because yeah. there's something critical about sacred time. We've been... Sundays, listen, I'm, I'm a believer in Sundays. I just believe in Sunday. And that was one, and again, everybody do it no way. That's one of the reasons why I kept up with a live experience on Sundays. Mm -hmm. um, the advantage of pre-recording and, and whatnot was, you know, you're able to edit stuff and put a good product out there. Um, but I believe in the organic offering yeah. of the... The, the organic offering hmm. of uh, imperfect imperfect worship mechanics to a perfect God because it yeah. wasn't always yeah. perfect. Yes, we, you know, we, we weren't able to edit out the fact that the alto went too high mm -hmm. and all this yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I am a believer in Sundays that there's mm -hmm. something particular. Mm -hmm. about, and again, I ain't tripping. You do it, you do what works for you in your context and, and based on your own beliefs. So I spent some, I spent too much time on this one. Number one, emphasize the gather experience. Um, the other thing I would suggest as a strategy is right now is a time to clearly define and communicate the mission of your church. Mm. Clearly define it. Because even if even if some people knew it before, it just gets lost in the sauce here. Yeah. And some people, some people don't even know what the mission of our church is, what hmm. that really is. Hmm. Um, and so we need to clearly define it and yeah. communicate it, put it out there to the point where people get it. People get it. This is your, this is your thing. I hate to use the word brand, but this yeah. is, yeah. This, this, this is your brand. This is your mission. So that, so that would be number two is to clearly define and communicate what is your mission. Hmm. Number three Another strategy going forward is to make an intentional connection between mental health and spiritual wholeness. Mm. 
Yeah. We gotta yeah. do this. We gotta do this because um in this pandemic, there was a poignant, a poignant sense of loss, the loss of normalcy, loss of money, loss of life, loss of illusion. Um, uh, and, and when we saw suicide attempts, attempts uh, rise, uh, mm -hmm. people who people who had, and I read this in Time magazine, that people who had mental distress before mm -hmm. the pandemic ends up having mental disorder. Mm. People who have mental disorder end up coming out with mental illness. <laughs> so everybody got some, either mental distress, mental disorder, or yeah. mental illness. Yeah. And yeah. so we got to set up um, seminars, workshops in our churches, um, invite people, some people who specialize in counseling and therapy to do, to to, to, to do something during your Bible study time, whatever, so people's consciousness is raised about the need of being mentally healthy. So that would be number three, is to make an intentional connection between mental health and spiritual hope. Um, number four, I'm gonna go through this quickly, is to focus on what's left and not on what was lost. Wow, wow. Focus yeah. on what's left, yeah. and more specifically, focus on who's left and not on who was lost. But mm. when I say that, when I say lost, I'm not talking about, um, you know, bereavement and death. I'm talking about people who just ain't coming back. Right, and, right, right. And we, are, and we are crying the blues about <laughs> who we may lose instead of really focusing, focusing on who we have left. And this may be an opportunity to, ch to change some leadership, to get some other people uh, uh, involved and to use their gifts, et cetera, so I think that's where our focus needs to be. Who's going to help this church to grow from this point on? And it may be different people than were there before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. So that would be number four. Um, mm -hmm. Number five, arrange for non-traditional connectivity. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Arrange for non-traditional connectivity. Um, I, I'm not the author of this. I got this from my from my uh, my friend, my boy, uh, John Guns, and he he talks about this a lot. Um, arrange for non traditional connectivity. He he told me he had things going to his church, like uh, whether it's a, a book club or exercise club, on and on and on, finding new ways for people to connect. Because he says, John says that engagement is going to be more important than attendance. Mm. Mm. We just want people in the seats. I do. And so he says, but that, that ain't going to be enough in light of what people lost in the pandemic, which was that sense of connectivity. So for the next, for the next couple of years in our churches, we have to arrange for and set up opportunities for non-traditional connectivity. Got to be something more than just annual usher's day. Hmm. You know, Got to be something more than Willing Workers Choir uh, anniversary, you know, and I, I don't frown on, on, on any of that, but there has to be some non-traditional -tra connectivity. Yeah. Uh, I, think that's, I think that's number five. And then number six is to invest in, continue to invest in the online experience. I mean, even if we do, if even as we do come back, that worship, the church has to be 100% physical and 100% virtual, both. So virtual used to be a supplement. Hmm. Now hmm. it's gonna have to partner, it's gonna have to be an equal partner <laughs> with the physical. Um, virtual you just used to be the side thing, you know, yeah. and now it's gonna yeah. have to be an equal partner <laughs> with the uh, physical experience. So. Uh, invest in the online experience. And again, do it on your level. Do not compare yourself with that place perhaps who has 20,000 members and they're able to do this, that, or the other. Okay, God bless them. And But God, once again, judges us according to our context. And so I think it's going to be critical to invest in your situation for where you are. What can we afford? Right. Um, right. Right. And what is our need? 
Mm -hmm. And I may not have the staff to do this and the other. I can get a couple of volunteers and work our way to the point where our virtual experience is matches our physical experience. Hmm. Um, and then, then the last thing I would say as a strategy, and I hate to be so simple here, but rediscover Christocentric preaching. Hmm. And I hate to call that a strategy. You know, you would think that that's a given, but rediscover Christocentric preaching. And to, I know we say, well, we, we always preach Jesus. No, we don't. No, 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 we don't. Um, I think it's time for us, and, I, and I'm and I'm guilty of it, not intentionally preaching him enough. I may refer to him, but preaching the the teachings of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus, his compassion, on and on, his his words. Sometimes, just look at his words. Preach, preach about the prayer life of Jesus, which was so evident. Right now, I'm reading through the Gospel of Luke in my devotions. And what keeps popping up to me is he went away to pray. He went away to pray. Before he made decisions in the morning, he spent time in prayer in the evening, evening, morning. That was Jesus. So my, my, my point is, is to rediscover Christocentric preaching. And I could spend a long time here because I, I just love talking about preaching. And that preaching about Jesus, we need to preach not just principles, but images pictures of Jesus that we see, uh, uh, not just points, but images, colorful images that Leonard Sweet talks a lot about this in, in, in what we say about Jesus, because he says, Leonard Sweet says that trauma makes people open to right brain preaching and right mm. brain preaching is preaching of images and pictures and not propositions. And that's what people are. So that would be the last thing I would say in terms of strategy is to rediscover preaching Jesus. I love that. I love that. I love that. I, so, so emphasized gathered experience. Yeah. That's number clearly one. Clearly define and communicate the mission, the right. mission, then make an intentional connection between mental health and spiritual wholeness. That is so vitally important um and focus on what's left and not what's lost i love that um and 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 even because thankfully there have been some new connections made in this pandemic and i i i i always make sure to emphasize that to our folks here at second baptist i'm like hey look we have new people uniting with us in this season and sure. you got to celebrate that um, and, and, and put them to work, too, mm -hmm. you know, to make sure that uh, that the back door, we we close that back door and don't let them just slide through the house and get out right. the back door. Right. Um, right. And, and and I'm sorry, but yeah. just just to interject this, I, I, I didn't include this in terms of a strategy, but it probably needs to be listed to be more intentional, just based on what you just said, be more intentional about discipling people, hmm. uh, be more hmm. intentional yeah. about discipling people because one of the things that discipleship does is it gives people a new world view. Um, discipleship puts new glasses on people so that they begin to see the world, their lives and God through the lens of scripture through the lens of the word of God and not through the lens of their own opinions, not through the lens of what, what they're, or, or not through the lens of what they're seeing from CNN and Fox and MSNBC. So I would say we got to be intentional about discipling. Hmm. Yeah, that, that I, 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 I hear that definitely, definitely. And, 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 I, I love the part about arrange for non-traditional connectivity um, that you you yeah. took took inspiration from from Dr. Guns. That's important too because um, we're, we're we have to be able to attract the non-traditional church person, right? The the one that you know is just looking for something to speak to them in this season that might not be packaged 
you know, right. in a in a church hat and a, <laughs> a shirt and tie, but you know, might might come through a cup of coffee, a shared cup of coffee at a coffee shop or a book club, like you said, or sure. other exercise things, things like that. That's so I love it. I love it. And then investing in the online experience. I think uh, Dr. Maurice Wallace or Maurice Watson rather said, um, uh, you know, that he is realizing that he now has to figure out how to be an online church with an in-person experience, mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, like you said, the online thing. Yeah. 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 You know? yeah, yeah. He said, it's the reality that we got to figure out how, how does that work? Um, and then rediscovering Christocentric preaching. Love that. And, and the, the figuring out ways to do effective discipleship or di discipling programs. Um, so, I, I guess, um, you know, we, we're pretty much done here, but with, with all this going on with COVID-19, you know, craziness with race relations and all this other stuff, I mean, even our, our Asian Amer American brothers and sisters are feeling the brunt of racism these days like never before. And uh, then to throw on top of all of this, this sort of uh, spiritual apathy as you say right um what 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 are we supposed to do with all this what are we supposed to do how, yeah. how would you kind of sum up what what we need to do and and say and how wh who we need to be you know moving sure forward? sure sure um i i would say that the things that, that the things that you mentioned are you know some social ills that we have to confront in addition to that, I would add a big one is our is is urban violence. Hmm. I mean, yeah. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. It's just it's just one of one of the burdens on my heart, man. That I know. Shoot, I, I heard in New York City, the, the New York City vicinity, that since the beginning of the year, um, twenty one people have been shot and killed under the age of eighteen. A couple hmm. of those being few of those being kids. I, I would imagine some other cities have yeah. similar kind of uh, 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 similar kind of scenario, and so, but you don't hear people making a lot of noise about that. Mm -mm. So somebody gets shot by the police, we marching and we protesting, but more of us get shot in situations like that than mm -hmm. we do in what we make a whole lot of noise about. Anyway, I, I think that. The church is going to have to have a balanced ministry of saving souls, but also of social action. Hmm. When you sacrifice either one of those, and, and in our, and this is a little bit of commercial, our, in our How Should I Hear preaching conference this year, which is in November uh, 16th, 17th, 18th, y'all register as soon as you can. Um, <laughs> that's what we're talking about. The balance, real, being a real evangelical right. is to balance soul winning with social action. Any church, any ministry, any movement that emphasizes one over, over the other is not being true to the gospel. Mm -hmm. So I think, generally speaking, you know, our churches can't just be concerned about changing the world, but about changing our worlds, the world that your church exists in. And, and if enough of us change our world then the, then the world will be changed hmm. and most of all listen i want us to be reminded and please forgive me i'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence or any kind of anybody's spiritual uh acumen but more than anything trust god <laughs> <laughs> i'm sorry I, 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 i'm sorry but listen i want to I want to read something that blessed me in all of this in the book of Zechariah, chapter 10, verses 9 through 12. This is really short. Listen to this. Though I scatter them among the peoples, yet in distant lands, they will remember me. They and their children will survive and they will return. I will bring them back from Egypt and gather them from Assyria. I will bring them to Gilead, Lebanon, and there will not be room enough for them. 
They will pass through the sea of trouble. The surging sea will be subdued and all the depths of the Nile will dry up. Assyria's pride will be brought back down and Egypt's scepter will pass away. I will strengthen them in the Lord and in the name and in his name, they will live securely, declares the Lord. That's what I'm going on. And that's what I'm, that's, listen, I hate to say it, but this is not my church. This is God's church. And I got to remind myself of that weekly when I'm tripping and I'm stressing and I'm crying the blues and I'm tossing, I'm tossing uh, all night long, tossing back and tossing and turning, trying to figure out how this is going to happen, trying to figure out how that's going to happen. Listen, man, this is not your church, brother, sister, pastor. This is God's church. Do we do our best to do what we do and to give this thing our all. But when it comes down to it, this is God's thing. Wow. And that's when, and, and that's when I'm going to rely on. I love that. I love that. That that's so important to to just just trust God, you know, um, because God's in control. And and I I remember uh my 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 pastor, uh, uh, President Keith Bird, uh, senior, he 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 t- says all the time that, you know, God's not going to take you somewhere. God's not going to keep you um, and, and sustain you and and make sure that things things work out. So, yeah, trust God. Trust God. I, I agree. Um, I am certainly grateful um, to you for for sharing some of your time today. Sure. And I. Um, I, I pray that, uh, you know, God continues to, to bless you and sustain you and the, the great folks at the Calvary Church there in Morristown, New Jersey, and, and all that you are involved in. Um, I, I certainly do pray that God sustains it and, and builds on it uh, for you and, and all that you um, are doing. Um, and, and so as our time is kind of winding up here, um, on behalf of the Baptist Convention of DC and vicinity, once again, I just thank you for uh, uh, being here today. And and I will say, those that have not um, been involved with uh, his his conference, how shall they hear preaching conference um, this year? I'm sure it's going to be great. It's great every year. Um, and this year, their theme is unrolling the scroll, reclaiming evangelical uh, preaching. And so, certainly, uh, go to his website, look it up, social media, what have you, and sign up. Um, it's it's going to be great, I'm sure. And uh, you will uh, uh, be be glad that you uh, participated. And so um, thank you to all who tuned in today. Uh, God bless you. I pray that the rest of your conference this week, uh, this annual session, the Baptist Convention of D.C. and vicinity, I pray that it goes well um, for you. Stay tuned for all of the other uh, things that we have going on, worship this evening, as well as um, tomorrow with uh, the women's luncheon and all, all of those things. And uh, the in President's Night, of course, uh, we certainly want you to be in place uh, virtually or in person if you're able um, as we strive to uh, do what God is calling us to do in this season. And uh, my prayer is that God will certainly shine on each and every one of you as we strive to be uh, the church that God has called us to be. So once again, God bless you and heaven shine upon you is my prayer. Go in peace, get you some lunch. And, uh, and, and we look forward to seeing you in later sessions.